Our next lesson is called Radical Equations. So for this lesson, I'd like you to start with the following opening exercise. Solve the following equation for x. So this is actually a review of our first chapter of the year, Solving Equations. Go ahead and pause the video, try this question on your own, then resume the video to go over the answers. Okay, now that you had an opportunity to try this on your own, let's go over the opening exercise. When solving an equation first, you want to simplify as much as possible. So we'll look to do distributive property first, which we had. 2 times 2x is 4x. 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. So that's 4x minus 10. Then I look on the left-hand side to see if there are like terms. There aren't. On the right-hand side, there are not like terms either. So we move on to our solving steps. First, variables on both sides. So since it's even in size, I can either get rid of the negative 11x or the 4x. I'm going to get rid of the negative 11 by adding 11x to both sides. So that gives me 20 equals 15x minus 10. Then I'm going to undo the addition or subtraction that's on the same side as the variable. So I added 10 to both sides which gives me 30 equals 15x, and then I divide by the coefficient of x to get x alone to see that x is 2. So the reason we wanted you to do this as your opening exercise is to remind you that when you're solving an equation, you have to use what we referred to as inverse operations in order to get your variable alone. So the inverse operation of addition is subtraction, the inverse operation of subtraction is addition, the inverse operation of multiplication is division. The inverse operation of division is multiplication. So the inverse operation is referring to the operation that you use to undo what's there. So we're going to keep that same idea in mind as we move forward and talk about radical equations today. So before we do that, let's do a nice little quick review of where we've been with perfect squares and non-perfect squares versus perfect cubes, which we talked about a little bit recently in one of the previous lessons. So first of all, what are a few examples of perfect squares? So remember what a perfect square is. It's the result of a number times itself. So to get the first few going, you would want to think, start with the first counting number of 1. What's 1 times 1? It's 1. So our first perfect square is 1. Then we move to 2. What's 2 times 2? It's 4. So my next perfect square is 4. So then I would also have 9, because 3 times 3 is 9. 16, because 4 times 4 is 16. We would then have 25, because 5 times 5 is 25. Then 36, because 6 times 6 is 36. And if we continue with that pattern, we would have 49 from 7 times 7. 64 from 8 times 8, 81 from 9 times 9, 100 from 10 times 10, 121 from 11 times 11, 144 from 12 times 12, and we could keep listing them. So those are examples of perfect squares. Non-perfect squares would be ones that do not result in a number times itself. For example, 20. There's no number times itself that gives you 20, that's why 20 is not a perfect square or part of this list. All of these perfect squares, when you take the square root, you will get a counting number, which means that all your answers will be rational. If it was not a perfect square, when you take the square root, you're going to get an irrational number, an ugly decimal that goes on forever and doesn't repeat. Now, in the previous lesson, we also asked you to think about perfect cubes. So when you're thinking about perfect cubes, you're thinking about the result of a number times itself three times. So if I start with one, that'd be one times one times one, which is one. Then if I think of two, two times two is four times two is eight. 3 would be 3 times 3 is 9 times 3 is 27. So if we did the same thing with 4s, we'd have 64. If we did it with 5s, we'd have 125. If we did it with 6s, we'd have 216. And just like before, we can keep finding more. All right? This is going to be important to us because today we are going to solve equations that involve a radical. 
the x is either going to be squared or it's going to be cubed, and we're going to have to undo it in order to find the answer and solve the equation. So it says, in our opening exercise, when we solve the equation, we simplified using inverse operations. When we solve radical equations, we also do the same thing. Radical equations also have inverse operations. So for squaring a number, to undo that, you're going to take the square root. And if you're cubing a number, the inverse operation would be to take the cube root. So when we're solving these radical equations today, we're going to fill in a couple blanks underneath here. It says today we will work with square roots, right? So we'll have to take the square root to undo x squared. So remember what the symbol for a square root is. You're going to draw it like that. And then we will also be working with cube roots today because in order to undo x cubed, we're going to have to take the cube root. So when you write that, make sure you put that square root symbol but with a little three on the outside. So now let's look at it in action and solve some of these problems together before you do your activity to practice on your own. So it says, find the positive value. So remember for eighth grade, we're only considering the positive value of x that makes the equation true. So look at number one and we're gonna look at x. x is being squared. So if I look up here, what's the inverse operation of squaring a number? taking the square root is going to undo it. So we would take the square root of x squared, take the square root of the left side, and whatever we do to one side, we do to the other to make sure it stays in equation and equal and in balance. If I take the square root of x squared, I just get plain old x. If I take the square root of 25, I wanna know what number times itself gives you 25, and that's five. So the answer is x equals five. Looking at number two, Again, we have x squared. So the inverse operation of squaring would be to take the square root. But before I even do that, I notice something else sticking out over here next to the 25. I have an exponent of negative 1. So here is chapter 2 exponent rules coming back into the mix. The first thing I want to do before I undo the x squared is simplify. That's the same thing that we did in the opening exercise. I simplified that distributive property before I started solving. So same thing here. I want to simplify this first. If you recall from that chapter, we write it as a fraction. The negative exponent wants me to take it and flip it. So it becomes 1 over 25 to the first power, which is the same thing as x squared equals 1 over 25. Now we can do the inverse operation of taking the square root which means x is equal to, in order to take the square root of 1 over 25, you simply take the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. So the square root of 1 is 1, and the square root of 25 is 5, and this is our answer for number 2. All right, in number 3, we have x cubed. So the opposite of cubing a number is taking the cube root. So we'll take the cube root of the left side, and the cube root of the right side. So cube root of x cubed is gonna give me x. You can take the cube root of eight on your calculator or think to yourself, what number times itself three times gives you eight and it's two. So on your calculator, the way you would do this is there's a button where if you hit second, you're gonna have something that looks like this with a little X on the outside, and it'll allow you to put a three here. If you're struggling with this part, just make sure you ask your teacher to point it out um, when you can. All right, then in number four, it says X is squared. So we wanna do the opposite thing, which is taking the square root. So we're gonna take the square root of X squared and the square root of 169 and we find out that x is 13. And of course, we all know where that square root button is on our calculator. Now, sometimes 
they are going to give you a word problem that asks you to set up your own equation and then solve it. So this says a square shaped park has an area of 324 feet squared. So as soon as I hear that it's about a square, I'm drawing a square. And I know the area is 324 feet squared. That's important to me. I also know that since this is a square, whatever side this is, this is exactly the same. So I'm going to call them both S because I don't know right now what the length of the side is. It's asking me, what are the dimensions of the park? So if it asks you what the dimensions are, it wants you to find the length and width. Now for us, that's going to be nice because since it's a square, as soon as I found one, I found the other. They're the same. So we're going to write and solve an equation in order to figure out the answer. So according to my picture, remember the area of a square is just doing side times side, which is the same as doing side squared. We're going to fill in what we know. We know the area. The area is 324. We don't know the side, so we're going to leave that S. And now you can see how this has turned into an equation that looks just like some of the ones we did in the prior activities above, 1 through 4. If S is squared and I want S to be alone, the inverse operation of squaring is taking the square root. Whatever I do to one side, I do to the other. And then I see that it's 18. So my side length is equal to 18, and this was in feet. So to check on my calculator, I would just plug in 18. So I would say S squared equals 18 squared, which indeed is 324, and it works. So this concludes your lesson on radical equations.